And that's the question of the day, that's the question of the month, is why in the world would God leave the glory, the beauty, the perfection of heaven and come to a place like this that has people like us? There, there's some mystery involved in this because this is not the usual way that things that things go about when you're talking about belief systems or faith systems. Why would, why would God leave heaven to live here? Well, we got to understand a little bit about God, and we're we're going to learn more about Him because He's going to He's going to tell us what He had in mind when He left heaven and became human. Now, we've probably got a pretty good idea about why Jesus died. If someone asks you, why did Jesus die? Your answer would be something like, to forgive us our sins. And that's important, and we should never lose focus of that. So that's good, but let's turn the question around. Why did he live? What compelled Jesus to live as one of us? Back to John chapter 1, the word, the eternal logos, the eternal son of God, the word became flesh, became human, took on a human body and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Now at the time when Jesus showed up, this was not how religious systems usually worked. The pharaohs and the emperors were all trying to have themselves declared as gods. And, and all, the, all the direction of all the religion was from, from here up, trying to, to get to God or become God, something along that sense. So this idea that the God of our faith system would change the direction, that he would take on human form, well, in ancient times... That just, that would just make no sense. And especially coming from a bunch of Jewish people who at that time were not very highly regarded by anyone in the world. But here he comes. See, this idea was so offensive to the culture of that day. Nobody would make this up. Not only wouldn't they make it up, they wouldn't perpetuate the lie all the way to their death. Maybe that's what makes it a bit more believable. Every religion ever invented by man was always directed from man to the gods, whatever that god might be. Christianity, however, not being invented by man, but rather being revealed by God, Christianity in its entirety is from God to man. And so that's how we come to know who our God is and what he's about. Now, Jesus is going to explain this a little bit later on to his disciples. When you get to John chapter 14, we started at John chapter 1. When you get to John chapter 14, this is after three years of ministry, three years of miracles and of teaching. And now Jesus knows what's coming. He is about to be betrayed, arrested, beaten, crucified, killed. And so from John 14 through John 17, this is the last lecture. This, this is Jesus giving this, this final word of wisdom, of grace and truth to his disciples who would carry on the kingdom work for him. If your Bible has those red letters, remember we just did the red letter challenge and the red letters are the words of Jesus as they actually appear in your Bibles. From John 14 to the end of 17, it's all red, except for two lines where a couple of his disciples managed to ask really dumb questions. So in, in, he starts off in chapter 14 saying, Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Then I'm going to come back and take you to be with me. Then he says, You know the way to the place I am going. Thomas speaks up. Thomas, if he had it to do over again, would never say another word when he's talking to Jesus Christ. But Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And in comes verse 6, famous verse time. 
Jesus answers him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Oops. Jesus just got a little exclusive there, didn't he? But that's how our God works. He sends his son. But Jesus wasn't done there. He goes on in verse 7 to explain what that means. He says, if you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, it's pretty straightforward, but now it's Philip's turn to say something. And he says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Three years of miracles. Three years of being with Jesus every moment of every day. And Philip wants another sign. He wants more proof. He wants Jesus to perform again. This has got to be one of those times where I think Jesus does a divine eye roll. And, and just quietly to himself tells his father in heaven, I can't believe the morons you've stuck me with. And he answers him, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Don't you believe that I am in the father and the father is in me? The words I say to you, they're not my own. Rather, it is the father living in me who is doing his work. He says, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. So Jesus is telling us now why in the world. Jesus came to live among us to communicate and demonstrate what God is like. Because if God did not reveal to us who he is and how he is, we would never know. But through Jesus, we discover some really wonderful things about our God. For one thing, God is holy. God is righteous. God is perfect. And because of that, his standards are righteousness, holiness, perfection. What that means then, the second thing, is that God is just. The rules are still the rules. He does not change them on a whim just because people want things to change to make it just a little bit easier or maybe more attainable. And this God as being a just God, this is something people really struggle with. This is where Aaron Rodgers is struggling with God. Because Aaron Rodgers cannot figure out how a loving God would condemn people to hell. Well, something you got to understand about God and about people. For, for one thing, heaven is a gift. Heaven is God's gift by his grace. Hell is a choice. The people that are condemned to hell chose that. When they rejected God. When they decided that their lives and their will and their imperfections were more important. God does not delight in the condemnation of anyone, but he's not going to drag anybody into heaven either. And, and would you really expect God to invite people over who hate him? I mean, to, to, to bring people into his house who hate his guts and hate everything about him? And, and by the way, look at it this way. If you said to me, well, Pastor Steve, I absolutely love you. You are a phenomenal deer hunter. You are a tremendous golfer. And you have the physique of a 20-year-old. I, I, I just love everything about you. But I can't stand your son, Andy. Now, how do you think I would respond to that? That's how God responds to people who reject his son. Because if you reject the son, you've rejected the father. You have rejected God. You have rejected heaven. Because God is just. And maybe the most important thing that we learn about God through his son, Jesus Christ, is that God is love. Notice I didn't say God is loving. God is love. 
He is love personified. He is love in the flesh. And it's the greatest love you and I can ever know is this love from God. It's from that love that all the other loves that we ever call love, it all comes from our God. And we would not know this if he did not communicate and demonstrate this to us through Jesus Christ. Now, people want, they want to know God, they want to understand God, but they're not always sure, sure where to look. And, and this becomes a problem because we tend to look to understand God in all the wrong places. You know, we, we look to our circumstances. We look at the events of our lives and piece them together. And that must have been God. Or, you know, so God might be good. God might be bad. Maybe God doesn't care. Maybe God isn't in control. Our ability to interpret our circumstances is terrible. We're just not that good at figuring those kinds of things out. So that's not going to get us anywhere in terms of understanding God. Sometimes we, we look to our traditions to, to help us understand God. And by that I mean we associate phrases or thoughts that we've picked up along the way, maybe based on how we were raised or, or, or what kind of life's path we've led before. But see... Traditions can be wonderful things until you become addicted to the tradition and forget the meaning. But what traditions tend to do is systematize and then customize, then overemphasize, and then fossilize. So if you were raised in a legalistic tradition, you're going to think that God is angry and judgmental and he's just looking for sins with which to squash you. And so you got to work to make him happy. If you were raised in a, in a somewhat liberal spiritual environment, maybe God isn't even a he, maybe God is an it or a she or whatever we have constructed to, to make this God into. And so that, that impersonal God really is distant and doesn't care all that much about what you and I do on a daily basis. If you were raised in an evangelical type spiritual tradition, you might have the idea that if I just decide this one thing, if I say this one prayer, then that will make God my God. I will claim him as my own because I decided to and I said so and I prayed so. Because the prayer is magic, you see. Or if you're from a, a reformed tradition, well, God is responsible for everything, the good things and the bad things. And so you really have... No say in your life whatsoever. If you have been raised in a Lutheran tradition, you might start thinking that God has done everything and expects nothing. There, there are folks who have come from church traditions where those churches don't know what to do with divorced people. And so those folks who go through divorce don't know if they're allowed to be there anymore. Or churches who don't know how to talk about gay people. But the only talk they come up with is harsh and judgmental and name-calling. And so those folks feel left out. If that's how your God is, then I don't want them. So that's what happens when we look to, to our traditions. Another danger would be to look within, to our own feelings, to our own thoughts. And that way, maybe we'll understand some more about God. you got to watch out for this, because people today have really gotten addicted to feelings. Well, let's face it. Let's be honest with ourselves. Our feelings change. It's roller coaster ride. It's up, it's down, it's in, it's out. That's what you want to base your eternal well-being on, is how you feel in any given moment. We, we have totally messed people up with, with this whole uh, feeling addiction kind of mentality about life. For instance, we can't even tell boys from girls anymore. Because it's now, it's, it's based on what you feel. Well, I asked this question to the confirmation kids, and one of the kids in my class, in a moment of absolute brilliance and wisdom, when I asked, how, do you, how can you tell a boy or a girl, and he said, look down. I thought that was genius. Because you see, it's not your feelings. 
that control who you are, that control your life. And it's certainly not going to be your thoughts or feelings that help you understand God. Another way that people miss God is when they start looking to nature, and maybe that'll explain a few things. Um, God is, is the creator, and he's the God of all nature, but nature, it, you know, we see the, the beauty of it, right? But we are usually seeing beauty at a distance. You know, it's like, uh, like a giant city. Nature's just like that. You know, if you picture a giant city, if you're getting like the, the drone shot from a couple thousand feet up in the air, the, the city can look beautiful. Even Chicago can look beautiful from that high up. But you get down on the streets, and beautiful is not the word you're going to use. And, and nature, nature has a viciousness to it. I mean, it, it can look beautiful in paintings and pictures. But if you're a mouse and there's a hawk nearby, it ain't so pretty anymore. Nature does not know anything about compassion or forgiveness or justice, so it's not going to tell you all that much about God. See, all, all of four of those things, you, you can get little snippets or even little hints, but in Jesus, we find a demonstration. God reveals to us who he is and what he's about. If we go back to John chapter 1 and verse 18, John would go on to say, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. See, that's the key. Why in the world did Jesus become one of us? Quite simply, it's to explain the Father, to explain God, and to understand what motivates him. Consider, consider the words of Jesus in John chapter 10. He says, truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And then he says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Paul picks up on that in Romans chapter 5. God demonstrates God shows us what his love looks like and sounds like and even feels like because God has that much love that while we were still sinners while we were still undeserving while we were still failing to be the people he's called us to be even in spite of all that God loves us so much he sends Christ to die for us It was not a death that Jesus earned for himself. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, God made him who had no sin. That's right, Jesus had no sin. He committed no sins ever. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus became human in order to become sin. And in Jesus, we become righteous in God's eyes in order to become children of God. Like John said all the way back in chapter 1, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh. He became sin. So that we can become children of God. I wonder what, what motivates him. Why in the world would God do that? Well, I think Jesus himself gives us an answer in chapter 3. And, and I happen to have it on my tie here, but it's a little tough to read upside down. Um, if any of you can see that from out there, help me out here. Um, 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's why. I want to give you a little homework this week. Ooh. Read the Gospel of John this week. 21 chapters, you got seven days. If you do the math, that's several chapters a day. But read it with this question in mind. What do I learn about the Father from the Son? Will you pray with me, please? Holy Lord God, you have revealed to us who our holy Lord God truly is. You are righteous. You are just. And Lord, it is that righteousness and that justice that causes us fear because of the judgment we know we deserve. And yet, you are a God that is love, love in the flesh. And when love died on the cross, our sins died with him. But when you raised him to life again, you also raised us to new life. But now, sin no longer has that hold over us. Forgive us, Lord God. Save us from ourselves. Remind us over and over again who you are and what you're about. And if we're ever wondering, if we're ever confused, if we're ever unsure, we'll just look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the word who became flesh, the Son of God, who has truly told us and shown us what love is all about. In his name we pray. Amen.